Good morning, and welcome to the Stanford University Libraries. I'm glad to see so many friendly faces here. I know we're going to have a very, very interesting and most apropos talk from our distinguished visitor, President Thomas Ilves of the Republic of Estonia. Uh, I'd like you all to switch your cell phones to stun. <laughs> and I'd like you all to know that we are streaming this talk to the world. We are recording it. And thanks to the generous permission of uh, President Ilvis, we will be restreaming this talk ad infinitum. <laughs> it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you. My name is Michael Keller. I'm the university librarian. And uh, I have other roles around here, too. Uh, it's a great delight for me to welcome President Ilvis back to Stanford. President Ilvis is a Stanford parent. His son, Lucas, graduated here in 2009, and Lucas has been involved with the libraries during his entire career as an undergraduate here, and since then, as a member of my visiting committee. His advice is highly valued. I'd like uh, to introduce Professor Michael McFall, who is going to introduce uh, President Ilvis. You may know that Michael McFall is a professor of political sciences here, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and similarly at the Freeman Spolia Institute. He has served for several years in the National Security Council under the current administration, and has just completed a two-year stint of what I would call a severe hardship tour in Moscow. <laughs> he's, he's very glad to be back. Michael, please take the podium and introduce our friend, Thomas Ilvis. Thank you. Well, first, let me correct the record. Uh, hardship posts, I would not describe it that way. Uh, for any of you who have ever visited the residence that the US ambassador lives in Russia, you could hardly describe it as a hardship tour. Uh, look it up, Spasso House. You can do a virtual tour if you'd like. But anyway, it's great to be home. It's great to be back. Uh, after five years in the government and five years away from Stanford, uh, I can tell you, for those of you who've spent your whole life here living in freedom, there's nothing like losing your freedom and regaining it to make it more valuable. And there's nothing like having to live five years away from the greatest university on the planet and the greatest place on the earth to live. In my, that's just my opinion. Uh, and so it's really great to be back. Uh, I'm not going to go on long uh, to introduce the president. You all know him. Looking at his biography, I want to tell you three things. One is, I knew him as a researcher. I don't know if you knew this, uh, but back when Report on the USSR was my favorite publication, uh, the most important place to understand what was happening inside the Soviet Union towards the end of its days, uh, and I remember, this was before the digital days, right? So when it, we got shipped to, uh, back then it was CSAC, the Center for International Security and Arms Control. We fought over who got to read it first. Uh, it was a tremendous publication. So life as a researcher, uh, very important. Second, life as a government official. President Ilvis has had every important job you can have. Let's just leave it at that. He was, he was elected to the parliament. He was foreign minister. He was U.S. ambassador here uh, in the very early days. And of course, since 2006, uh, president of Estonia re-elected in 2011. Um, and therefore, to know and to speak authoritatively about how to make government more effective in the 21st century, uh, nobody is more qualified. But third, uh, I did serve five years in the Obama administration. And at the White House, we had an initiative on open government. Uh, we wanted to be like Estonia, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. We wanted to do uh, the innovative things that the president has led his government in doing. And so there is, and we didn't do it, by the way. I, I forgot, we're on the record. Uh, we tried to do it, we have, and we're still trying. And to my colleagues back in the government, please keep trying. But it is a challenge to uh, think about how to reinvent the relationship between people and accountable government. And uh, I know reputationally, no country in the world has advanced that proposition more than Estonia. So how appropriate that in the Silicon Valley, at Stanford, 
uh, with President Ilvis, we should be having this conversation and this lecture today. Third thing, and I'm, this is not part of our agenda, but I have to say it. Uh, given events in Eastern Europe right now, given what is going on uh, in Ukraine and what Russia is doing, if you want to understand Russia and you want to understand the challenge of our times, and I consider it to be uh, an incredible challenge of our times, you have to follow President Ilvis on Twitter. Uh, and if you're not, you have to do it today because I've been a long time follower. I joined Twitter after you, President Ilvis. Uh, but when I did, uh, uh, when the Secretary Clinton told me I must, uh, <laughs> she did. Uh, you were one of the first people I started to follow and I just encourage you on that other issue. He covers everything in his Twitter feed, but there's no greater authoritative voice and librarian for other voices. Uh, on Twitter about our current crisis than the president. So please follow him on Twitter and please uh, help me in welcoming him to Stanford University. All right, All right. we don't have that much time, please. <laughs> I see. Uh, can, I get, uh, can I show this here? It's already up. Not me, I meant the dog. <laughs> I meant the, the New Yorker cartoon. Is that there? No? Okay. All right, well, what I'm going to do today, I'm not going to talk about es uh, Estonia and Ukraine and uh, Russia uh, because, uh, I mean, no, I wanted to, is, is the dog up? The yeah. dog's up, okay. <laughs> All right, we'll get to that because I, would, I will argue that is the fundamental issue of our time. It, and I mean that seriously. Um, all right, I'm not going to talk about Ukraine today. I mean, I, unfortunately, I have to talk about Ukraine elsewhere because it kind of just crops up all the time. Uh, but I'll talk about what I love to do and talk about, which is uh, uh, the future of, a, of the digital world uh, from, uh, the, if, <clears throat> from the experiences of a country that I would argue, I'm mean, not I would argue, I mean, basically talk to anyone. It is probably, we are probably the most wired country in the world, but it's not the wiring and the... Uh, and the high tech that matters, it's actually what you do with it, the kind of how you implement it, what, are the government, what does the government offer to its citizens, what can citizens do in a world that we live in today with the possibilities that we have. Um, and I think this is a perspective that uh, doesn't really exist too much in the United States because, uh, because it's um, for a variety of reasons, but I mean, you, have all the, you, you do all the wonderful technology you have all the great uh, inventions that people can buy, but in terms of actually using IT to uh, make the, <clears throat> the life of people better, um, you don't do such a good job of it here, nor does anyone else really, I would argue. Um, we, not that we ever actually thought it would come out to be this way, uh, but today we are, we are the, uh, unfortunately, we are the most wired country in the world. We have. Uh, we basically, 99% of our prescriptions are done digitally, so you go to any pharmacy in the country, you just stick in your card and you get what you want. Um, people don't use paper prescriptions. We, the, we just had our seventh election uh, with um, of e-voting, and once again, I guess for the fifth time, we'll probably have 25% of the population voting online and securely. Um, all taxes are done online. Uh, we've now gotten to the point where we, uh, the Finns have taken over our system and so we will have the first interoperable system anywhere so that a Finn can come to Estonia and get his medicine and vice versa. But those are real, little things I get to. Basically what, we, what we've done in my country is, um, is found serendipitously often solutions that uh, we weren't even looking for, I guess that's serendipity, but in, in any case, I've ended up where we are ahead of everyone else. But I'll, I'll walk you through the thinking that we've had over the years, and then I'll talk about uh, uh, some of the key things one needs to do to have a digital society, whether or not you do it the way we do it, but there are fundamental and core issues that need to be solved, one of which is that one there. 
Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about some of the problems that we will be facing and what we have to face and we have yet to face in light of things such as Snowden revelations, which I think changes a lot uh, and should focus us more on uh, what we have to do in the world that is, that is inevitably going to be more and more wired. But anyway, back to how it all started. Uh, back in 91, Estonia became re-established its independence. Uh, and uh, the key thing for us was that in 1939, where before we were occupied by the Soviet Union and followed by the Nazis, followed by the Soviet Union, our neighbors across the way, Finland, who speak a language almost as bizarre as ours, um, Estonia and Finland were at basically the same level of development. GDP per capita was more or less the same in terms of sort of the metrics of development such as telephony. I mean, how many telephones per capita? We were ahead of the Finns, so we were technologically more advanced. When we became, uh, when we reestablished our independence, there was a 30-fold difference in GDP per capita between Estonia and Finland, which you guys gives you an idea of the wonders of communist development. Um, and in terms of, uh, we were still using the 1938 phone system, um, whereas the Finns uh, had, were, ex were going from their uh, sort of top of the line analog model over to digital in 1991. So here we were, we're a very poor country. I was the ambassador in Washington at the time. Um, poor, undeveloped, and we're looking around and we see that, well, for 50 years we didn't build highways, overpasses, develop social services, didn't do anything. Uh, and so what are we gonna do? How are we gonna catch up? And so, well, there was only one place where, in fact, we, were, we felt we were on a level playing field, and that was in IT, because everyone was backward then. Just to recall, it was in uh, 1993 that the first web browser, Mosaic, was invented by Mark Andreessen, who was, I guess, in Illinois and is now here. Um, like everyone else, they're here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so here we were, thinking, well, you know, this is something we should be doing. Um, an additional factor, which just strictly personal, was that uh, I, having a brilliant math teacher in New Jersey in 1968, uh, I was taught how to program. I was 13 years old. Now, if I could learn how to program at 13, then, uh, and which became a skill that I, which I managed to use when I was in college, programming in assembler language, in hexadecimal, if that means anything to anyone, uh, meant that um, they said, well, it's not that difficult if someone like me, and I'm not a geek, well, I'm not that kind of geek, um, uh, could learn it, that then this is a key that what we should follow in, in the future uh, for our educational system. And then the final thing that really swayed me was reading uh, uh, a Luddite neo-Marxist book called The End of Work by Jeremy Rifkin. Uh, and he had this great example there of a... Uh, of a steel plant in Kentucky that was, that had employed 12,000 employees um, and produced X million tons of steel. And then the Japanese bought it and they automatized and computerized it and they still produced X uh, million tons of steel but they did it with 120 people. Now for me, or for Estonians, we have this incredible angst about our small size. Uh, that, you know, there are just too few of us and how are we going to compete in the world? And this was, in fact, and if you read, the, you know, the economic literature, everything was about economies of scale. And if you don't have any scale, you get kind of suicidal. So that, um, so I said, well, this is great. We should really computerize everything because, in fact, uh, then we can increase, we could, I mean, we could have the same functional size of uh, economies as the, uh, as big countries if we are, in fact, completely computerized. Uh, I'll come back to that issue at the very end because I think it, where I think I've, ch I've changed my thinking on that because it's all going to come and haunt us soon, uh, and maybe Rifkin was actually right, but that's a different issue. So anyway, so what we did was um, we started pushing for uh, pushing for uh, the digitalization of the country, which at the beginning was almost impossible. Uh, one key lesson we learned immediately, which few countries have and which uh, is the plague of 
old successful countries like the United States is uh, legacy technology. And the kind of perfect example of this was that the Finns, being nice friends of ours, wanted to give us for free a 1979 telephone exchange that they were switching out for, for a digital system. And I fought tooth and claw and nail and whatever against taking this gift because the alternative was to actually spend a lot of money to, to buy a new telephone system that was digital. Uh, and so everyone was saying, well, let's take this. It's a gift. And I said, no, no, no. You don't want to get legacy technology. That means you'll be stuck with a 1979 level of development, which, OK, in 1993, wasn't that far ago. But nonetheless, it, uh, well, we won that battle. And then uh, within uh, six months, we had a completely digital telephone system throughout the country, which meant that I had a better signal calling the foreign ministry in Tallinn than calling Foggy Bottom three miles away in Washington. Um, but I mean, so what did we do? We embarked on this thing more or less haphazardly thinking, what are we going to do? But we do believe we want to move ahead in uh, technology. And so actually, just a few months after the first web browser, we had our first government homepage. Um, we went on and uh, started connecting all the schools up and putting computers in. So by 1998, all kids in Estonia were hooked up to the hooked up with computers in their schools, which, given that we were a very backward former Soviet republic, was an amazing achievement. Um, but then we started taking it more seriously, and we moved ahead to uh, doing some innovative stuff that had, was not simply technological. Um, the first thing that we really did that was important was to, uh, to get a digital ID card for, I mean, a chip-based card, uh, which provides a unique identity to everyone, uh, which is, if you know anything about tech, it, is a, uh, it, is a, it works on a binary key code. Uh, if you want to get really geeky, it's, uh, it's encrypted at RSA 2048, just to give you an idea, the NSA shut down LavaBit last year because they were operating at RSA 512. In other words, it's eight times more strong than what the NSA couldn't break last year. So we're, we're OK with it for a while. Um, and this, again, it was nothing really innovative on our part. The Finns had done it. We took it from the Finns. We just took it a little further and said, everyone has to have one of these cards. Now, the re I'm going to stop by and just sort of focus on this for a minute, because I'll speak louder. This is the fundamental problem of all, of all social, governmental, state-related, commercial-related issues uh, on the web. Because unless you have a guaranteed identity, um, anything can happen to you. I mean, here in the United States, you buy things online with a credit card. You put in your credit card number and you enter a three-digit CVC code in the back of, your, back of your credit card and you think you're secure. No. I mean, it, you need a two-factor, two-factor independently verified identification of one form or another. If you don't have a digital identity, uh, you will not get anything done, or you will always be insecure. That is one of the bases, one of the fundamental uh, sort of core issues of developing a digital society. Because if you don't know who it is, or someone else says they're you, um, then uh, you can never trust what you're doing. And we're using the, uh, I mean, we're using uh, this digital infrastructure uh, more and more, more and more, and more and more, and everything is becoming digital. But if you don't have a secure identity, it's, not, it's going to collapse and it's, coming, it's going to come back and hit you sometime. And all of these cases where you have passwords stolen uh, for, by the millions, um, it all comes down from having insecure identities because you can't steal the password if you have a two-factor two identification system at the level at which we have. Uh, unfortunately, not too many people use this. The next step is that once you have this genuine digital identity is that you make it equivalent to, legally equivalent, to a signature. 
Uh, that is, you can sign documents with this identity. You can't do that with a credit card. Um, and when you give a digital identity, the legal equivalent with all the tort and contract law consequences, that is when you can begin to build the digital society. But you, uh, right now, I understand in the US, you, you can tag on a PDF of your signature. That's not a digital identity. That is not a legal signature. Um, so this is, this is key. And that would, and would will be a recurring theme throughout in what I talk about is that it's not the technology so much as the, uh, the social or, uh, or state software, also known as the legal system that you need to get right in order for a digital country to function, a digital society. And so one, the first thing you need to do is have a law that says that a really good, safe identity is equivalent to a signature. And then you can start signing documents. You can do all kinds of things legally. We just signed last December uh, the first uh, first state-to-state -state agreement ever signed digitally with the Prime Minister of my country and sitting in the capital, Tallinn, and the Prime Minister of Finland sitting in his capital in Helsinki, and they signed a document, a treaty, or international agreement. Anyway, from there, we've gone on to uh, do a number of other things that, again, are based in law. Uh, one law which is crucial that, um, well, Okay, I'll get that in a minute. First, the second thing we did was we were very poor. Uh, and we just, we, while we had taken this path of saying, okay, we want to digitize everything, um, and let's put everything on a big server, and then we realized we didn't have the money to put everything on a big server because we didn't, couldn't buy a big server. Uh, and so then this is where serendipity came in. We had some very smart mathematicians who were looking around and saying, well, if we can't put a, get a big server, let's connect all the servers we do have, because every ministry has its servers, every agency has its servers, the police have their servers. And so we ended up um, using a, something called an enterprise service bus, which would connect all of the various servers in the, in the country. Again, with all inter-server communication based on, uh, again, on the very secure uh, identification system we had, which then we realized was far more robust, far less susceptible to any kind of hacking, and far, uh, and far more reliable than having one big server. Uh, all of that fell out of uh, not having enough money to buy a big server. In fact, now we, uh, countries are adopting the same system that we have of having a distributed architecture uh, of the kind that we have in Estonia because it is far, far more secure. Once we did that, then we passed another law, uh, which was, I don't know how we came upon it, but it was brilliant, which is a once-only law, uh, and just to make you feel envious, that is, if the, government, if the government may ask you for information, only that information it does not have. So if it already has information, for example, because of your ID, they know where you live. They know your telephone number. So does everyone else. I mean, it's all there. So the government cannot ask you for anything you've already provided. When, if you think of your taxes, think of all the times you fill in your address, your social security number, blah, 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 all that. You don't have to do that anymore. Uh, not in Estonia, because if it's there, they, it's on record and they may not ask you. This ends up having huge advantages for complex things such as registering a company where you have to, I mean, you have to answer all kinds of millions of questions. If you want to register a company, you know, has, have all the members of the board paid their taxes? Have they paid their alimony? Or have they been in jail? I mean, all that stuff has to be answered. And in a traditional system such as yours, you know, you hand in your big stack of papers and then you know, one agency looks through and says, yes, you paid your taxes, sent to another agency, now he's paid his alimony. They've all paid their alimony. And this moves from instance to instance to instance, and finally you get your permission. Well, if you have this once-only law, and you submit everyone digitally, then in fact, in 18 minutes, you have your business, if you fulfill all the criteria, you are registered as a business. So this, that, was, that was another step forward in making society far more efficient and, again, once again, uh, reducing the number of people you need to make the government work. 
Um, then we decided to go a little further and, and then uh, instituted e-voting. Uh, again, this is not voting on or going to, uh, it was in Ireland, you go and you, you go to the polling station and they have a computer and then you press a button. This you can do on uh, via your ID card. Um, let's see, I'll show what it looks like. What do I do? I, how do I get this? What do I press? The <laughs> that okay. Anyway, there you have, that's the ID card. Uh, it is, um, it, all it is is a chip, and you have this code that you use, the two codes you use to make, uh, to sign things with that card. We also got a brainwave then suddenly saying, wow, what is that chip? That chip is a SIM card. If you have a SIM card, you have one in every phone. So in fact, you can use that chip and you can do the same things with the SIM card chip in your phone. And so then we developed, in addition to the ID card, we developed the, um, uh, the same system for your phone. So you can in fact do everything that you do, vote and pay your taxes. You can do it all on your mobile phone. Now, you might think that's kind of weird, but on the other hand, uh, I was visited by the Afghan IT minister last year, and they want to adopt our system. And then I said, well, how many, how many computer lines do you have in a country of 30 million? And he said, 200,000. Uh, I said, okay, how many mobile phones do you have? 20 million. Well, if you have, I mean, if you think of the situation and basically most of the developing world today, people don't have computers. But the other phenomenon is that there's this massive explosion of mobile phone use. So in fact, using a mobile phone, you can in fact develop all the goodies that you get with an e-government. Um, since we're already, let me see if this works. Let me see if I can get this to... All right, now when I, when I talked about the digital signature, I'll just do a two minute clip here for you to see the benefits of it. I hope sound comes out. This sound coming out. There are times when old fashioned solutions don't meet our modern demands, like signing documents and contracts with a pen and paper. Today's digital world demands a more flexible and responsive solution, like digital signatures. Let's take Filippo, whose business partner is based abroad. Whenever they need to countersign documents in the course of their work, it can end up taking them weeks to get a deal done because of all the paperwork being physically sent back and forth. It's such a waste of time. Now, if Filippo and his business partner used digital signatures, they could close their deals in a matter of minutes, not weeks. They'd only need to select a document, right-click it, sign digitally using their secure PIN code, and then send it off by email. The process is completely paperless, and in the European Union, a digital signature is just as valid as one made with ink. But it gets even better. With a mobile ID, Filippo can sign documents, make bank transfers, and more, all from his mobile phone. Wherever he happens to be, and with whatever papers he needs to sign, whether they're for business or other legal purposes. Studies have shown that using a digital signature helps to save an equivalent of one whole working week per year for every working age adult. Just stop and think for a minute what you could do with a whole extra week of time. Or take the environment. If in a small country like Estonia, which is a pioneer in the technology of digital signatures, it's been found that a stack of paper as high as the Eiffel Tower could be saved every month, imagine how much it could do to reduce the waste for other larger European nations. Digital signatures benefit everyone, from common citizens and enterprises and all the way up through governments. It raises productivity and efficiency, helps to reduce our impact on the environment, and establishes a uniform digital market in Europe. There. Well, so that, that all has helped our little country uh, to actually save a huge amount of labor, uh, made us much more efficient and allowed us to uh, become probably the most digitized economy or digitized country in the world. Now, then of course, it's not all that rosy uh, because as we are developing and becoming better and better, we also were becoming, as it happens in these societies, more and more vulnerable because more, the more your society is, uh, the more complex and the more high-tech you are, then the more susceptible you are to major damage. 
Uh, I liken this to the cockroach theory of, the, of nuclear war, because basically, if you have a genuine nuclear war, this is something you guys don't know about anymore, but anyway, you used to worry about nuclear war 30 years ago, and the thing is that if there were a nuclear war, then the only, the, uh, only, uh, only organisms uh, as complex as uh, cockroaches and lower would survive, because anything that was more advanced than a cockroach would not be able to withstand it. So, so too, we are the cockroaches in Estonia. Um, I mean, basically what happened in 2007 was that we came under massive cyber attacks, um, which really um, I mean, forced us to rethink a lot of things because uh, uh, as a highly digitized society, we are more vulnerable than a lot of other countries. I used to joke that there are a whole bunch of countries, even in the European Union, that if they came under cyber attack, they'd never know. Um, <laughs> Well, in fact, I mean, now things have changed considerably, and in fact, everyone would know, and I'll get to that later. But anyway, so, uh, uh, and this is sort of gives, uh, I'll just briefly touch upon some of the problems that, you, that come out of this. I mean, for one, uh, you realize that you are far more vulnerable f because of uh, adopting strategies that otherwise make you more efficient. Uh, secondly, that you are far more, uh, I mean, you see how dependent you po are upon everything, and one of the things we found was that we were being so massively attacked, we had to cut off our country from the rest of the world in order to just to reduce the number of attacks. I mean, that was not the best solution, but that was the first thing we, we could do at the time because we didn't really have a strategy to come out of this. Uh, Basically, we, uh, one of the other problems here is forensics. Uh, one of the fundamental issues with cyber attacks is that it's very hard to, to determine who's doing it. I mean, you can make a correlation with what's going on in the outside world, and we have a pretty, pretty good idea who is doing it. <laughs> but um, you can't prove it. And that becomes an issue, by the way, just if you think about it in the future. I mean, if you have a, imagine an electrical plant, uh, which you, and uh, someone sends a missile in it, blows it up. You can see on the radar where it came from, you know what to do, you're going to shoot a missile back at them or whatever. If your power plant is attacked by malware and it collapses, it has the same effect as being blown up. The problem is you don't know who did it. And this is a big problem that, will face, that faces us constantly in cybersecurity, is you don't know who did it. Um, well, we know more or less who did it. And, um, uh, it turned out to be, uh, as we say in the world that plays soccer, one's own goal. Um, what was that in American football? Touchback or something? I don't know. Anyway, um, because we have been petitioning NATO for a number of years saying, look, cyber threats are a future threat. We need uh, NATO, which has all of these cyber secure, I mean, all these centers of excellence, sort of academic centers all around NATO studying different things like the. Germans have a center of excellence for operations in shallow and enclosed waters. I mean, that gets pretty specific. So we say, we kept saying, well, look, cyber is the next domain. They said, nah. But then, in fact, what happened after the attacks, NATO said, oh, we think we better study cyber. Uh, and so now we have a NATO center for cyber defense in Estonia, which was probably not the result. It was not the desired result on the part of the people who, who engaged in attacking us. But it worked out really well. Uh, but that, that is also talk, I mean, that also demonstrates where we are in the world. I mean, in 2007, people still didn't believe we needed to be worried about cybersecurity. Uh, I gave the first, I was participating in the first panel ever at, on cybersecurity at the Munich Security Con Conference, which is the premier conference on security in 2011. So that was three years ago. That was the first year that the premier conference on security touched upon cyber. So things, things changed slowly, and, uh, and the, but things that in reality changed quickly. Now, so where are we today? Um, well, uh, we, have, um, we have this system now in which uh, I hope will become, at least uh, some form of this system will have to become a, a model for any genuine cyber, or rather, uh, digital uh, society. You don't have to do what we did, but uh, I would submit that you need to t uh, have at least a, you ne at least need to have something as a secure identity. You need to have a decent distributed architecture for safety. And a couple of other things. We have a law that says you own your own data, 
which is a very big thing. Most countries, you don't own your own data in Estonia. You own your healthcare data. You own whatever data the government has on it. You are the owner. Uh, you decide what to do with it. You decide who can see it. Uh, or if you can't always decide because the government wants to look at it, you at least know they've been looking at you. Um, and you put it all together, and you, those are more or less, I would say, the legal sine qua nons of moving ahead in the future. Where I see society going, at least in Europe, is that uh, where we've taken the first step with Finland is that we now have a common platform, slowly working out how you provide services uh, across borders interchangeably using a secure ID. We offer about 350 services right now for citizens, both public and private services. I mean, banking is far more secure with, a, with this ID card that we have. Um, than any other system, and uh, so too healthcare records. I mean, the kind of implications that come out of this is that you know you always say get a second opinion from a doctor. Um, well, you don't have to get a second opinion in Estonia. You, you can get 300 opinions because all you do is you decide which doctor can look at your medical records, and the medical records are all there. So I mean, so they're all online. Um, these are kinds of things that. Um, ultimately in the future, I think most citizens will want. It's a little easier here in the United States because you're a single market, a single country, all within one border, and people rarely go abroad. In the European Union, you have 28 countries, and each one has its own legislation. And if you get sick in another country, especially if, uh, since you don't have a common language, this can be problematic. Uh, I headed the European Commission Task Force on eHealth, where we set out the goal, which is that you, all records are digital online and automatically, uh, automatically translated. So if an Estonian who speaks an unintelligible language goes to uh, Greece, which is unintelligible to most people, uh, and he gets sick, uh, then the doctor in, in uh, wherever, Heraklion, goes to the computer, puts in the ID card, and then you get the medical record and there it says, it's translated from the Estonian into the Greek, and so he knows that you have a problem. Um, now, a lot of stuff, I mean, I mean that's kind of the ideal picture. Uh, a lot of the uh, moving toward the ideal picture is going to take a long time in Europe uh, because not many countries are willing to do the legislative changes. Finland is... We're hoping that we can establish something with uh, Sweden and Denmark and Norway uh, soon, so that if, at least in the Nordic area we can kind of go around and get sick in each other's countries. Um, <laughs> where, when the rest of Europe will do this, I don't know. Uh, Europe uh, is, uh, especially since last year and the Snowden revelations, in fact, I think has moved politically in the, in the opposite direction, being far more suspicious of anything that, is in, that involves IT, far more suspicious of data being out there. Some, uh, some ideas get pretty crazy, uh, but this, when you see this uh, sort of this inward turning where you don't want things to go across borders, um, you can see actually we're moving in a, in a direction that is not very good for the state of, for the state of um, development. Um, and if you, uh, if you think of what, if you think of where we should be going, um, we, we should be in fact opening up data. I mean, we have an open government initiative where all, all data is available uh, all government data fundamentally is available to its citizens. I mean, and we have and we've been developing programs, so in fact you can read it excessively. Um, uh, uh, excessively. Um, the trend, I think, is going in the opposite direction. We are so concerned about privacy that, in fact, um, transparency begins to suffer. And I, I think there is this, um, there's an innate tension between privacy, which we think is a good, and transparency, which we think is a good. Uh, and uh, we have big fights about it in the European Union. A couple of years ago, Estonians believing, or Estonia and some other like-minded country believing that it's a fundamental belief that all public expenditures should be public. Uh, and we, so we, since 40% uh, of the $1.2 trillion 
seven-year budget of the EU goes to agriculture, uh, and that had not, no one knew where it went or who got it. We, we pushed through this thing in the commission saying that, in fact, we have to know who gets what, um, because it's our money, it's public money. Uh, and then it lasted for two years, and then a bunch of countries took, took the commission to court and won in court, and now, once again, it's a strictly voluntary thing to say who got what public monies because they were appealing to the principle of privacy. Uh, so privacy and transparency are, can be mutually antagonistic, and that, I predict, will be a future problem for many of us. Um, which we haven't resolved, and I think we're only beginning to deal with the issue of privacy um, in the post-Snowden environment. Um, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about the sort of more theoretical issues um, that are associated with this. Um, back in, um, uh, in the 1960s, um, Marshall McLuhan uh, said that we live in a global village. Um, I think he was wrong. Because in the television age, what he meant was that we can sit in our, in our living rooms and look at the Vietnam War and you think you're right there. But that's not a village, because in the village you also have the lady next door who tells everyone what you've been doing. Um, so, I mean, it was an incomplete metaphor. Uh, because the, you are simply a watcher, but you are an anonymous and no one knew what you were doing. You could just watch in your room. Uh, but internet technology has changed this. Uh, we, now we do live in a global village, and governments, Google, all the various apps in your smartphone, which you think are just for, you get for free, but in fact someone's monetizing you, uh, all your credit card swipes, all of those things are out there, and, people, and someone or somebody or, or lots of people know more about you than you probably even know about yourself. And so this is, this is constant and intimate surveillance. This is actually, we have re reached the kind of surveillance uh, capabilities that you see in uh, George Orwell's 1940, uh, 1984, which he wrote in 1948. Uh, and every mobile phone, every iPad is in fact uh, empowered and capable of doing that. I mean, uh, you know, you don't have, you have your camera here. I, I tape mine over. I would suggest you do that because someone can hack into your phone and they can or into your into your computer and and follow you and there's been cases of that not only by I mean I don't know if the government does it but certainly all kinds of weird people do that and they have hacked into people's phones so I mean privacy has really changed dramatically um, and I guess especially with the use of big data um, these days you can do all kinds of things that you never could imagine doing uh, there's a book by, uh, on big data by a guy named uh, Meyer Schoenberger, who uh, is a professor at Harvard, and he brings this case of, uh, of, a, um, of a company that did direct mailing of pregnancy products to women based on their consumption behavior, which apparently is different from non-pregnant <laughs> women. And, uh, and so what happened was they, um, they get this irate phone call uh, from a father saying, uh, you just sent my 15-year-old daughter a pregnancy product. Uh, what are you doing? I'm going to sue you. I mean, it's something you do in the U.S., I guess. And then um, the problem is that they, they got their data on who's pregnant and not pregnant based on credit card swipes. Um, because, and you, because if you have enough, if, if you have enough millions and millions of credit card swipes, you can tell who, what you buy, and you put, this, put all the picture together, and you say, this is, fits the profile of a pregnant woman. Who happened to be the daughter of this guy who was irate, and so then they, just being the United States, where they figured they're gonna be sued for a billion dollars, said, we better call him up, make him a deal, or make him an offer, and get him to quiet down for this mistake, and then they call up the guy, and he's very contrite, saying, you know, I had a heart-to-heart -heart with my daughter. She is pregnant. <laughs> uh, so the point is that all kinds of people know all kinds of things about you that you may not even know, or you're about your daughter. Uh, and so, so privacy has changed fundamentally because there are capabilities now that no one could imagine before or that were imagined by George Orwell in his dystopia. Um, 
And so the question is, wh where are we today? Um, uh, Grateful Dead lyricist John Perry Barlow, who I guess lives up the, the, the highway here, uh, had a famous, in, his famous independent, declaration of independence of the internet. He said, your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us, we of the internet generation. Um, I see he, he was right. He didn't add privacy to that statement. Um, but basically, what we, uh, what, where, where we have arrived, I would argue today, is the anarchy in the internet, in the internet world, is that is the anarchy of life described as, as the state of nature or a war of all against all in Hobbes uh, and Leviathan. I mean, he was trying to describe life in primitive society uh, where there are no rules and there's no ordering and... Uh, and that's where we are in the internet. Um, now, we in, uh, we in uh, democracies, at least, believe in John Locke's solution of a, of, a social, of a contract between the government and the citizenry. And that does, in fact, under, underpin the thinking behind all democracies. The problem is we don't have a Lockean contract about what, between the government and the citizenry, what the government can do, what corporations can do on the internet. Um, and so we have this massive debate now on what the government may do and what it may not do. And we have to get out of this state of nature. And I would argue that this, we have to start thinking about the philosophical underpinnings of what, what that relationship should be in the internet age. We figured it out in the 18th century, uh, and it led to the United States, among other things, with, uh, with Jefferson follow, reading his lock very carefully. Uh, but today, we need Lo our Locke, and we need our Jefferson, and we need our Voltaire to actually figure out what are we doing in this digital world. Um, I think a lot of the problem that we face today is actually comes from uh, what uh, sort of the problem that C.P. Snow described in uh, 1959, which is really the problem of two cultures writ large. Um, because there is a, he described the absence of dialogue between the humanists at Oxford and the geeks in Oxford, and how they were, you know, the, he was one of the few that bridges. He was a biologist who actually wrote poetry. But in fact, I mean, the people who were doing science uh, didn't really know what the humanists were doing. And the humanists didn't understand what the scientists were doing. And we, had, we have now gotten to the point where I'd say where we, this, this, this distinction has actually gotten us in very serious trouble because the whole thinking behind people like the guys in NSA, but also in Google and, and all the other tech enterprises, like, wow, we figured this great thing out, let's do it. Without really thinking, I mean, having no real humanist background, no real understanding of you know, you know, John Locke or, or, I mean, ethics, they just do it because you can do it and you can do amazing things on the internet. Uh, and, you know, and figure out amazing things and go into people's computers in amazing ways. But, there, but if, if you're only there because you, you think it's cool that you can do something like this without thinking about the implications, then you end up where we are today. I, would, I think my, my feeling is that a lot of the stuff that we saw coming out of Stone is the NSA sort of said, oh, wow, we can do this too. And then we can do that. And then they do it. I don't think it was that nefarious, but the results certainly are. Um, Another thing I should touch upon here today as well is internet governance. We just published, I headed the commission, the, what is the uh, ICANN commission on figuring out what to do with internet governance. The background to this was that uh, about a year and a half ago, the Russians and the Chinese in the, uh, the ITU, which is the International Telegraph Union, but was which was set up to monitor radio frequencies, among other things, sort of distribution of, wanted to get into the act of running or governing the internet. And then countries like Estonia and the United States and the UK and Germany sort of pushed back, fought that, saying, no, we don't want governments to control the internet. We won at the ITU, the forces of light and democracy, I would say. Uh, but. Then came Snowden, and now the pressure is on again. So ICANN, which is, uh, 
which basically distributed all of the uh, IT addresses in the world, which was run, it was set up by the United States because they were back in the old days, there was no one else to do it besides the United States because it all came from here and Vince Cerf and all these guys are all from here in the valley and so forth. So the, um, the question is how do we move ahead because it's clear that it is no longer possible, especially after Snowden for the internet to, to be administered, not governed, but administered by the, uh, by the United States. It's not politically doable, but this, at the same time, you want to sort of do it in a way that it's not, doesn't lead to governments in running it. We want to have a multi-stakeholder model. Uh, we were just produced our report. We hope, uh, hope it is followed so that we don't have governments running it. The, the alternative, um, alternative can also be fairly bleak for us. I would say this is almost a Huntingtonian clash of civilizations between those countries that are mainly authoritarian, that want to censor and restrict the internet, uh, and on the other hand, a coalition of democratic nations that stand up for universal norms of freedom of speech and unhindered spread of ideas. Um, and that fight, um, I would say, is kind of a well, I don't know how it will go. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, the thing I fear is uh, what I would say a Westphalianization of the internet. Other people say Balkanization. I would ask you not to use the term Balkanization because it's, I mean, I'm from the Baltic, not the Balkans, but I mean, I feel for my fellow East Europeans that you know, being, having a negative term associated with your part of the world is not very nice. Uh, and uh, in fact, the Westphalian order, I think, is a more uh, appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate idea was based actually on the Peace of Augsburg that adopted the principle cuius regio eius religio, uh, which is uh, whoever's the ruler, that's the, the religion of the area. Uh, if you think of it in terms of internet freedom, whoever's the ruler, that depends on whether you have a free internet or not a free internet. And certainly there are a number of countries that are pushing for the kinds of uh, internet order that we decide whether what you can see uh, and if you don't watch out, we're going to push our stuff on you. So that's a trend that I think is, um, is dangerous and we need to avoid. Looking ahead at some of the problems we'll face, I said in the beginning, one of the, uh, things, that, one of the things that inspired me was reading this neo-Marxist Luddite book by Jeremy Rifkin. It's called The End of Work. Um, and at the time, I thought it was kind of silly, you know, sort of, I mean, I like the idea of the steel plant and we, you know, we Estonians can produce as much as someone else if we go digital. But in fact, that was 20 years ago. And you all know about Moore's law, I assume, that the power of a chip doubles every 18 months. And in the intervening years, there's been a lot of doubling. Um, now, you here have driverless cars. I mean, that would have been impossible in 1994. Um, smartphones would have been impossible in 1994 because the chips just weren't as powerful. And this is, and they're doubling again every 18 months. And so the way things are going is that um, in 10 years, say, having doubled again three times, four times, uh, chips will be so powerful that they will be able to do all kinds of things that humans do right now. I mean, let's th think in terms of the uh, self-driven car. It's in test phase right now, here in California, in Mountain View, I think, uh, and in Belgium, I read. I read an article recently, the United States has decided, uh, the US government has decided, or the DOD has decided they're going to start using uh, self-driving trucks because it's much easier to transport uh, materiel to, say, Afghanistan by having driverless trucks so they don't, I mean, if you run into an IED, well, okay, you lose something, but you don't lose a life. Um, well, if you think of the doubling of chip power, then in 10 years, would, will we have taxis? Will, we be, will you be fighting over Uber, uh, be servicing your city or not? Uh, will, you have, will you have truck drivers in 10 years? I don't know. But the point is the chips are getting so powerful that maybe Jeremy Rifkin was right. And in fact, that there are whole areas in the world, all kinds of jobs that uh, basically will disappear because, they, because a machine can do it 24-7, um, doesn't demand wages. Um, and we have to start thinking about this. I don't have, share as dystopian a view, but certainly when we're thinking ahead where we want to go as societies, 
at least in Estonia we have to think about it, is um, we need to actually incorporate IT so strongly into our education because in the future, if you don't, there are no more lathe operators. There are computers that run lathes, so you have to be able to, you have to be the guy that programs the computer that runs the lathe. Um, there will, if there are no more trucks, you have to be the guy that programs the truck, uh, and so forth. So we've, we've taken this very seriously. We, uh, I think we have the first uh, joint program in IT and JD degree in Estonia. Um, that's not for, I mean, I guess some people wonder, I mean, they realize that patent trolls are a lucrative area, but, but more seriously, um, n laws in the future will have to be written in a way to take into account the, the, the possibilities of, uh, that IT offers and also the risks that are offered by IT, privacy, identification. Uh, we're, we have uh, been running for a year already the first combined course in IT and public administration, also known as e-governance. Um, again, issues that you have to, I mean, public administration in the future, no matter what, will not be done um, by just people and paper. It will be, a lot of it will be based on uh, uh, IT solutions, uh, and slowly even the United States will get there. <laughs> Um, because you, it's, it's the only way to go. Uh, and certainly uh, that means we have to re we redo our educational system because ultimately those of you who are as old as I am, I mean, we think back 30 years ago, there were, all phones were fixed line. No one had a PC. I did, but I was kind of weird. But no one had a PC. Um, no one had a mobile phone. No iPads. I mean, society, life was completely different. I remember as a kid asking my father, how did you live without, without TV? Um, I couldn't understand that. Well, now, if, I mean, my children ask me, how did you live without computers? I mean, they just think it's so bizarre. I mean, do you have a phone attached to the wall? I mean, what happened if you were late? I said, well, then you got in trouble. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, the, the way we understand, I mean, the world's changed so dramatically, but our, our educational systems and our willingness to actually accept the changes, with the changes in, in offered by IT mean for our lives is not caught up with that. And I would urge everyone to start thinking about what this means for, for our societies in the future, be it issue of privacy, be it jobs, education, it's all out there. And I mention all these because Estonia is dealing with this constantly, and that's where we are. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I could answer some questions as well. You want to take your own questions? You want me yeah, to? I can. I, I, I think yeah. he can handle it himself. So. The floor is open. Are there? Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, you, you talked about uh, internet voting in Estonia, and this is of great concern to everybody here because your internet voting system is being used to, by vendors in, in the United States and elsewhere to push internet voting on us. Now, we know that your system is insecure. As you know, there was a team that just was in Estonia to present their results of some of the top computer security experts in the world. And what they found was that the um, security in the polling, in, in the center, in, in the election center was abysmal, that it's possible to plant election rigging viruses on the voters' machines, and that it's possible to uh, break into the main server of the election. And so my questions for you are twofold. All right, one question. Do you, you, you obviously think that you have better security than Google, Symantec, Northrop Grumman, the FBI, and so on, because all of these companies and, and institutions have been broken into. Our president has talked about the major cybersecurity threat in the United States. How are you going to protect, let me, let me. Okay, how are you going to protect your system against state-sponsored insecurity, and why don't you respond to the people who did the study? Well, one of the frauds. Um, <laughs> I mean, as simple as that. 
Uh, they put up, they said, I mean, they provided no evidence. Um, uh, they came out, this is a politically motivated action. If you know anything about IT, you know how, how people work? So they discover a problem, they quietly go to the company or the government and say, we've discovered this thing, how much are you gonna pay us? This was done, they do this regularly before elections, the same group of people come out. There has been no proof. They offer, the page does not offer any, any proof of any of this. Uh, the claims are not backed up. I mean, <laughs> So why, uh, why is our security better than Symantec and Google? Because we have a two-factor two -factor identification system. Google actually sells one of these things. You can, uh, you can buy it. It's, it's the system that we offer all our citizens. But there's no proof of this. And we're certainly not pushing it on the United States. Um, there's a very curious thing. I, mean, I didn't get into this, but I mean, it's uh, kind of funny how the, uh, the idea of having an identity is absolutely anathema in five countries. England, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia. They will never have an ID. In the UK, it's enough to have a gas bill to get an ID. What do those five countries have in common? They're the five eyes. So I never understood that correlation. But the point is, this is, this is, a, this is a group paid by one political party in Estonia. Uh, they come out and regularly, I mean, one of the same guys gave a, uh, gave a talk. You can it's, you can look it up. It's very funny. It says like e-voting comes from Satan. I mean, this was an actual conference that they held. So they're not serious. We're waiting for data. No one's provided it. They promised to provide the data, and uh, but they did do a great PR job. So that even before they came out with these claims, they had already sent off an article to. Uh, the Guardian and the article sent to the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung just appeared the wrong day. So I, we can't take it seriously. People who are seriously, I mean, these are not internationally recognized people. There's Jason Kitkat, who is a Green Party city councillor in, in, um, in the UK. I mean, it's not serious. Anyway, next question. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, you're talking about healthcare, and I think it's great that the efficiency of having hundreds of doctors potentially be able to look at your, your records. On the other hand, you lose the human touch, and that will go for education, that goes for healthcare, that goes for, you know, any time where you get efficiency, a lot of times you end up losing, uh, losing that human connection. And I wonder if that's something you fear for your society and how you, how you think about those issues. Well. I mean, basically, first of all, I would say that the term healthcare has, has to be revised in a digital age. Uh, healthcare, I mean, most of what uh, we uh, have called for the, since, um, since the era of um, Hippocrates is sick care. You go see a doctor when you're sick. Healthcare is doing all the stuff that you do, that you eat right and exercise and all the other stuff that you should be doing. So healthcare is the wrong term. Now, what we can do with, um, I mean, the, I don't think having a personal touch with the doctor is necessarily a good thing. The less I see my doctor, <laughs> the better I am. Uh, so if I have a health, if my health care thing consists of eating the right things and working out, um, means that I don't see my doctor, I'm a lot better than going to see him because I feel bad. Or think of the dentist. All our dental records are also online, by the way. I mean, I don't want to go see my dentist. It's the last thing I want is a human touch. <laughs> um, if you think about things in the future, um, what we, I mean, what we, we have, I mean, you're the, you, you have 70% of GDP going to healthcare or sick care. Uh, for most of Europe, it's around six to 9%. Um, for various reasons, but with the, uh, with the, at least in Europe, where you have this disastrous demographic py pyramid, where um, we have more and more old people who retire not, uh, sort of fairly early and are living longer and longer, I mean, it's not a good thing, but I mean, how, how are future generations going to pay for this? Uh, the one way we're going to pay for this is reducing the cost of health care. Um, and reducing the cost of sick care. The way to reduce the cost of sick care is to make sure people don't get sick, 
and I predict in the future we will be monitoring people uh, constantly. I mean, old people certainly will, will, will be uh, taking, I and mean, we'll have some kind of monitor uh, so that, you know, before you get really sick, you, uh, you go see a doctor, but you don't do it when you're in the last stages of it. I mean, what is the, what is the best monitoring system that, was, that existed uh, before, for males, before, uh, before the digital solutions? It was a wife, because they would notice things in the husband. It was just because wives live longer than husbands. Otherwise, I'm going to be sexist, just that turns out that they live longer. And they would say, honey, you better go see a doctor. You're doing something funny. You know, you're breathing funny or something. Uh, that's why the mortality rates for single men are much higher than uh, the rates for, for cohabitating men. Um, the thing is, we can do better than that, or we can certainly help out the single men uh, by actually having electronic digital monitoring so that, in fact, it turns out they can tell that you're about to get sick. And one example, for example, congenital heart failure which comes, develops over a period, and um, you, what you do is you have, when you sleep, you have to sleep at a higher and higher angle because otherwise you can't breathe. So in fact, there are solutions that allow, that in fact will monitor the angle at which you're lying in your bed. It's all very clever and brilliant and, and invented here in California, um, in Stanford, by the way, but I won't get into the commercial at the moment. <laughs> But the person who did it is sitting in a row in front of you. Uh, uh, but anyway, so you can see this. You can see that the congenital heart failure is coming. Uh, otherwise, you don't know. I mean, unless you notice that you keep putting more and more pillows behind your back when you're going to sleep. Um, so we can save lives. We, you, you see the doctor when you need to. Now, there's a bigger thing involved in this whole, uh, whole issue of uh, the personal, or doctors, which is that since Hippocrates, the relationship between the patient and the doctor is priest and supplicant. And I predict that will change. We will see a more, much more market-based relationship. If you don't have one doctor, you can see all kinds of doctors, ask them to look at your records. I mean, you'll pay for it, of course. But, but certainly, there will, the kind of competition that it will be coming, or is already coming. Uh, I know in the case of uh, in the UK, when I was on the e-health board, I mean, when people started looking at big data on mortality rates, hospitals, bed days, and they discovered there were hospitals where some people, where they had very high survival rates and very few number of days in the hospital, other hospitals that cost much more were people in the hospital longer and they had a lower survival rate. That wasn't known before, but now in the era of big data, we can say this hospital is a disaster, that hospital is really good. All of these things will be changing, I predict. Yes. And Estonia on the signing of the treaty. And I'm curious about the factors, whether it was just the fact that you speak a very similar language and how you see that common platform of digital signature expanding in Europe. Um, which other countries maybe Estonia is aspiring to also have similar type of digital signatures or working into the legal system so that you could facilitate more efficiencies? Anyone who's interested. Unfortunately, Latvia has not been that interested. So, I mean, I mean, what can I say? Uh, but, in fact, anyone who's interested, and uh, the, it's, I mean, it's not necessarily just the Nordic countries. I mean, uh, the uh, Catalonia, or in or Catalonia, uh, in uh, Spain, it's, even, it's a part of Spain that is highly innovative and interested in this, whereas the rest of Spain is not necessarily that interested. Catalonia has done what we've done with the chip card and put all kinds of services attached to it. The rest of Spain has not done that, at least when I last looked. So, uh, but it's not really, it's kind, of, it's kind of just happened that way. But it's the, since the Finns and the Finns and Estonians, it has nothing to do with the common language. It just has a, there is a propensity to adopt, to be an early adopter in both countries and to come up with solutions and innovative solutions and since they kind of run together. The background of the Finnish thing started when uh, they were going to buy for about a billion dollars a system from the United States that was, uh, uh, <clears throat> that was a proprietary software 
uh, closed software, and then uh, they realized that in Estonia we had a better system that was open source, uh, non-proprietary software, which they get for about 5% of the cost. And then when they compared the two, they said, why don't we go ahead and do this with the Estonians? And so, um, and then that was where the opportunity came of saying, well, why don't we just do it together? Before that, they were just going to buy one for themselves. But then he realized it was cheaper and it was better to do it with the Estonians. No one else had done that yet. So Latvia wants to come and do it. Ludzu. 